Yeah, you just want to get close to him. Okay. This is all very new. Me too. Yeah. I didn't know if maybe you do a podcast or something. No. I should, I but I'm always... Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Breakfast with Bob, Boston Marathon Edition. We're presented and hosted by Highland, Stop Your Cramp, Not Your Race, by Polar. Check out the Polar Vantage M in a Marathon Edition. And, of course, you can perform, work out, energize. We're talking a little coaching and uh, how people are going to do this weekend. we got Greg McMillan and Pete Ray. How you boys doing? Very well, thank you. I love doing it. Doing well. So, Greg, we go back a, a few years. Indeed. Amby Burfoot calling you one of the best and smartest distance running coaches in America. Over 5,000 Boston qualifiers. Yeah. It's probably closer to 6,000 by now. <laughs> 12 national champions and created McMillan Running Calculator. Talk about the running calculator. Well, it really was a selfish invention because I was coaching so many different types of runners. And yeah. when you coach a lot of runners that are different speeds than you, it's hard to know exactly the paces to give to them. And I was studying exercise science in graduate school and kind of came up with this formula that I could calculate based on just a few, a bit of information from the runner, exactly their optimal training paces for different types of runs. Right. So I created it for myself to help my own athletes, but put it on the web and people found it and now it's kind of has a life of its own. Isn't it funny how this is a different world now? You put something out on the web and you go, you can sort of test it and see what reaction is. Next thing you know, people love it. And you're there. Yeah, I know. And now I get to talk to you. It's fantastic. <laughs> so with, when, when you're talking about 5,000 Boston qualifiers, that means you've got elite athletes down to somebody who's trying to get here for the very, very first time. How do you balance that? Yeah, the bulk of people are, are the latter, are the ones who this is their dream. This, this is, is their Olympic. List. This is bu big bucket list. Uh, for a lot of them, it takes many, many marathon tries to get there. Uh, and so it really is a celebration of their running career. Uh, and so that's really rewarding uh, to work with those athletes. And, you know, getting to Boston, qualifying for Boston is one thing. And then the next step is, okay, can we prepare for actually running this course, which kind of is a unique uh, opportunity and challenge itself. When you're with your elite guys, because this race is a little different. There's no pace setters. This is all about, this is racing, racing in its purest form. When, uh, have you had an athlete who you, you know, obviously a great runner, but really did well when it came to the, this is head-to-head -head racing, mm -hmm. who really thrived on that type of experience. Yeah, I've had a couple of women be the top American here, and I felt like in both cases, their, the qualities of their mind was the difference in how they could race at Boston. It just requires uh, a more emotional control, yeah. I feel like, to do well. We see that maybe with like a Desi or a Meb. They right. just seem to have this emotional control. And they seem to always race smart. And that seems to be a characteristic that it takes to do well in Boston. So that's what I'm always cautioning even non-elites is you got to have a lot of emotional intelligence to go into this race and do well and control yourself early because this race sets you up to make all the mistakes it really does. that coaches are telling athletes not to make. Even these well-qualified racers, you see so many of them make those mistakes. So it's really about getting that mind right to race well here in Boston. Yeah, Pete, uh, Pete Zapp Endurance, 36 athletes in the Olympic trials from 1,500 meters to the marathon. So what, what do you see as the biggest mistake people make in this last week or so leading into the race? You find people piling up too many miles and getting too excited? Uh, from my experience, the biggest mistake people make is, is changing too much. Um, that, uh, you know, you'll see people, even experienced runners, uh, doing things like trying a new food for the first time the night before the, for the race. Coming uh, through the expo here and going, oh, that energy bar was good. I'll have five of those. Sure. <laughs> or, or even something as silly as, you know, you know, I've never tried that pair of racing shoes. They look so nice. I'm going to buy them and wear them tomorrow. And you would think that people would never make those silly rookie mistakes. And it happens a lot. So talk, a Pete, about an athlete who came to you and said, listen, I want to get to Boston. I want to get to Olympic trials. And you were like, no chance. This is, this is not going to happen. And somebody who surprised you yeah. with either just the fact that they overperformed what you thought they could do. Right. Um, that's a rare thing because, if anything, I believe most athletes um, sell themselves a little short. My experience Interesting. with, with uh, pros as well as the people we work with at our summer uh, adult camps at Zap, they'll tell you their goals. And usually my response is, I think you can run a heck of a lot faster than that. 
Um, I have been surprised a couple of times. Uh, I had a woman uh, on our team who Greg knows, um, Alyssa McKegg, who ran 231 for the marathon uh, at the Olympic trials, and it was actually a little faster than I thought she'd go that day. Um, but uh, it was never outside the realm of what we said was possible. So, and, and from, when you're talking from 1,500 meters of marathon, yeah. you're talking you're talking a big gap there. <laughs> and what is, when you, somebody starts out as a 1,500 yeah. meter person and you're training someone for that, yeah. and then the next day you're working with someone who's getting ready for a marathon, sure. how do you have to change your approach? Yeah, in a, to the Cliff Notes version of that is that prepping for a 1,500 and prepping for a marathon in many ways is not terribly uh, dissimilar. Um, it's the same basic principles. We're, uh, aerobic capacity is first and foremost what we work on. Yeah. The 1500 meter runner just spends a lot more time stimulating their VO2 and power and economy than a marathoner would. But actually, if you took a look at the training for the people we've worked with who are 1500 runners and marathoners, you'd be surprised at how similar they are. So when you look at your career, and, and first of all, you were a runner. Yeah. And when did you make the transition from running to coaching, and how hard was that? Um, you know, it's interesting. I, I ran collegially, uh, UConn, go Huskies, uh, and then ran, uh, <laughs> ran, ran full-time after college for just a couple of years. Um, but um, I was actually, even then, more passionate about working with others than I w was for myself. Um, so made the transition into high school coaching uh, in the early 90s, and then um, my wife and her late husband started Zap down in North Carolina. Uh, around 2000 and started working full-time with people who were doing it for a living uh, about 20 years ago. And it wasn't a hard transition. I was passionate about it from the start. So was Zap originally was mainly for pro runners? Uh, it's twofold. Uh, we have 10 athletes who are full-time pros who live there year-round full-time. And get funding through and, Zap. And they're funded. And then we fund it by hosting every kind of running group, high school teams, college teams, lots of clubs, and adult camps that we do in the summer. So, Greg, when we look back at where American running was and with Athletics West in the 80s, and then we sort of had this Death Valley for a long period of time, and then Mammoth Track Club and just the, the Hanson group and the Arizona group, how important are those groups in terms of runners developing? Well, we saw a pretty quick turnaround, didn't we? I Absolutely. feel like uh, even with Pete starting Zap at that same time and that group, of, of groups yes. uh, immediately started to change the landscape and they inspired like me I started a group several years after they did uh, because I was I was thinking I want to help too and I think that model is the model right and so started my group and helped uh, several athletes in, during that period so I feel like we we kind of know what works we have good models for what can work for athletes and really, it's just about getting more athletes and better athletes to go through it and stick with it. If we can do that, yeah. then I think we would see it. And you, you see this in, if you look at pictures from, say, a training group in East Africa. Right. Say, in one of the training camps in Kenya. There will be 100 to 300 guys on the track at one time. And they're all trying to be the best runner in the world. Yeah. Our groups, Pete's got 10, I had 15, some will have five. So we just don't have huge numbers. But I think we see that even with that model, if we just run people through that, we're going to have success. We're going to give people opportunities, and they will determine how good they can be, which is what they want. That's what they're driving for. I want to see how good I can be. What's fascinating, I remember talking to Coach Bob Larson a number of years ago and asking him about you know Meb. And talking about uh, different type of runners as well, you know, Dina Caster is a long, she needs longer workouts. Meb is more like Kirk Pfeffer, who was a runner he worked with in the 80s. So basically, Meb's running Kirk Pfeffer's program. I said, wait, wait, you're using a pro, this guy's from the 80s, and you're using a program from the 80s. He says, Bob, how is running changed? It's still one foot in front of the other, and you identify if this says someone who needs a lot of volume, this person needs more speed. How has it changed for you guys? Well, I think that we that is what's making the difference now is that it's not one size fits all. Yeah. And I think what we're doing is we've learned from all these great coaches like Bob Larson, yeah. Joe V. Hill, and all those guys. We learned the general principles from them. And now what we do is we tweak those based on what we learn and see in the athletes. So just like when Pete's watching his athletes train, he's watching them and learning 
this athlete pr responds this way in a workout and recovers from it this way and adapts from it this way. So that gives information to tweak the program for that athlete. And so I think within these general principles, that's what's making the difference is we're not running everybody through the same the same program it's not specific. cookie cutter it's not it's cookie cutter yeah. it's specific like more sprinkles over here more chocolate chips over there and that results in the exact recipe that works for that athlete and as a result they're not getting injured as often right they're staying more motivated because their workouts are going better because their workouts are more optimized for them and then their teammates start to run well and that of course makes them think well they can do that i can too and so now you've got a system where like at Peach program, where it, it's sort of all the athletes start to perform better. You know, w when I look back at you know, the lack of information that was out there back in the day, right? And, and athletes were very closed. And I'm not sharing my workouts. And it, it seems like I talk to high school kids, and they can go online and see what Meb does. They can go and see what, what their heroes, their, their other high school and college guys are doing. How important has that been where an athlete can look and say, well, if he can do it, like you just said, if he can do it, I, so why can't I, that people are sharing, figuring, hey, here's my workout. If he wants to go do it, hey, go at it. Because it's not, it's not the workout, it's how you, how you recover from it, how, you, how that enhances your, your running from there on. Uh, I would say uh, we all know that social media has, uh, has some detriments, but I will say one real positive is in that sharing of the wealth Absolutely. of information and our athletes keep in touch with um, the athletes that run for all the other post collegiate groups. They know what their training is doing. They trade ideas and, and we have an open forum, um, at least at our club, we have an open forum of talking about ideas for training and tweaks. And uh, when athletes come out of college, a lot of them know what they respond well to. And I want to hear that when they come out. But uh, yeah, the, the sharing, we used to think, hey, uh, I thought I was training hard until I saw what, uh, what this guy was doing or what this lady was doing. So it's helped a ton. How have you both had to change with you know, adding in more strength training, adding in more flexibility? Back in the day, it was go run, and that was about it. Now it's, there's so much more that you have to do to, to get to the starting line healthy. Yeah, it's interesting when you talk to older runners from that generation and you say, what would you do different? Almost always they say, I would have spent more time taking care of my body. To a person, they will always yeah. say that. And so you have to do the running. There's no shortcut around that. Yes. But I think another uh, thing that has really helped the new generation of runners is that they do spend a lot of time doing these ancillary or non-running activities. Yeah. And that also has changed over time. Because at first, that was a fuzzy area. I'm supposed to strength train, but as a runner, how do I do that? And I'm so worried mistakes. about adding bulk. Exactly. I'm mistakes were made, yeah. or, I, or I, I'm going to get injured because I do this. I'm tired from this leg workout. Right. But now I think a lot of strength training coaches have really dialed in what works for runners right. and how to balance that with their training so that it's not two different things going on. It's one cohesive program. So as a result, you see these athletes that are – really well trained in running but they stay healthy and can perform better because they take care of their bodies yeah. uh, throughout time and that's made a, a big difference in athletes being able to do more work do mm -hmm. faster work and recover faster from it now we see them extending their careers yeah. and as a result it gives you buys you time to get more experience and build build your body and mind you know you come out of the cocoon of having coaching uh, in college coaching in high school and then all of a sudden you're sort of thrown out, right? You're like, oh, what do I do now? I go make a living on the roads. I haven't really run the roads before. What do I do? I'm sure both of you are dealing with those athletes, not really sure what's next and what is the transition from college cross country track to I want to make, make a living yeah. as a marathoner. The yeah. longest they've been running is what, 5K trail runs in cross country. And now it's, uh, if I want to be a professional, I've got to go either run the track or got to go a lot longer. Right. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's actually fun for me when you see the athletes coming right out of college and yes. they join our team. They don't know anything about the pro circuit. They've run track and cross country in college. That's so it. So yeah. when you mention a road race, a lot of them say, geez, isn't that what like old people do? Uh, and it is. Yeah. That's what we do. Uh, but 
then they get on the circuit and they start running great races. We were talking about like the Manchester Road Race on Thanksgiving Day in Connecticut, which is, I don't know, 70 years old and and uh, going to races like the Shamrock 8K in Chicago and, and running on that pro circuit. And they realize like, hey, I love track and I love cross country, uh, but this road thing is good too. And I can I can make a living here if you're, if you're running well. And the road circuit is, I mean, it used to be, you had these these classic races, Runners Den and Gasparill and all, I mean all these races, and it seems like that there's a really good circuit now that athletes can make a, a good living, training and racing, and not necessarily having to run marathon and half marathon. Yeah, there's certainly road races everywhere, so there are opportunities uh, abound, and you know, like here, you see the boom in running has right. just driven so much of the business. In fact, we were talking beforehand. If you think back, uh, sort of pre rock and roll marathon right. and that whole generation of racing kind of growing up it's totally totally different world so there's lots of opportunities for athletes it's not an easy road no no it's a lot of competition you do a lot of work for uh, no guarantee so they really have to be passionate and and patient and uh, which is not always easy for young young people uh, but if they stick with it then uh, they can certainly finish their career saying i gave it my best yeah. and uh, and that's a good way to finish so, Greg, when you look at your career as a coach, is there one athlete you look at and look at proudly and say, this, this, was, this was the greatest athlete I've worked with? Well, that's difficult for me uh, because I, I worked with beginning marathoners yep. through charity groups and a lot of these Boston marathoners and, and even national champions sure. and Olympians. So it certainly would be easy to talk about the Olympians and sure. the international champions. But to be honest... I think with all of us in coaching, we like when we work with somebody that you know set a really challenging goal. They struggled in the process, but they stuck with it. They worked through the hard bits, yes, and they accomplished their goal. And that could be finishing a 5K. Right. That could be, I'm going to the Olympic Games. But that process, I think, is what all of us coaches love. So to me, I, I it's be difficult to say one because yeah. I've had – older athletes who did amazing things that nobody knows but me and the athlete because it was you know them within the race that they finished 175th but that was a great performance or the olympians so i think anybody that comes through and has those breakthrough that's really rewarding for me hey, you both have seen this transformation of running from rock and roll where before rock and roll we were what 80 percent guys 20 percent women and now it's you know 70% women, <laughs> and it's it's changed a lot. How has that changed the way you coach? How has that changed the way? And Pete, you can answer this: the the way you approach your athletes. You know, in, in the end, I think the principles of uh, it's something I was going to mention earlier. Yeah, the principles of working with athletes, um, whether it's um, someone who is on our uh, Zap Endurance Pro team and they run for a living or someone who comes to a ZAP summer camp and, and they run 10 miles a week. In many ways, the principles are the same. Um, you're just doing uh, a, lot more, uh, a lot more of something. So the truth is, when we work with athletes who are trying to finish that first 5K, like, like Greg said, in many ways, it's really not a whole lot different than, than working with the people who are doing it for a living. They're just doing it um, a lot less volume, a lot less speed work, and you have to fit it in around their busy day. So. Uh, it may not be the answer you were looking for, but uh, no, it, it, yeah. I, I don't. Um, not much has changed, and I and I really don't uh, coach coach women, whether they're beginners or pros, uh, really any different than the men I work with. Which is which is awesome. I mean, it, this is a great era for running. There's, I mean, look at the crowds here at this expo. Uh, our numbers have been huge at, at all these races, and people obviously want to improve. They want to. Yeah. If there's one thing that's that's a known is people want to get better. They, they get into something, and maybe they get into this to raise money for charity. And then they go, I'm feeling pretty good about myself. My body's looking better. How do I qualify for Boston? Yeah. And, and that's where you guys come in. Yeah. It's been wonderful. I feel like, you know, once you become a runner, you almost it's difficult to talk to other people about why it's so important to you, why you have that passion. And because they walk to, away and go, oh, my God, their eyes are rolling in the yeah, back of their running, eyes. Running is hard. <laughs> I didn't like it. They made me run in gym class, yeah. those kinds of things. But once people kind of get it, right, yeah. and they become a runner, that's how they define themselves, and it's their passion. It's so nice now 
that you're not alone. <laughs> that that pretty much everybody now knows somebody who's a runner. So it used to be it was one in a hundred people might be a runner, and now it's more than that. So it, I think the the community that is running and that shared experience, mm-hmm. no matter if you're at the front, the middle, or the back of the pack, it's all the same. Which is why we, after races, we hang around forever talking because we have this shared experience. Yeah. So I think that's been one of the really great things about the growth in running is just the shared experience and people realizing that this is an activity that's very accessible. You can do it anywhere. Right. There's a lot of people already doing it that are fun to be around and share this experience with. And you get all of the sort of health and, and mental benefits from it. And then you can have these ever-changing goals. I want to finish my first 5K. I want to run a half marathon. I want to qualify for Boston. It's just these ever-changing goals are really fun. So you can build it as a, it's a lifetime sport, and that's uh, part of the beauty of it. One, of the, I have, I have one concern I have is we've seen over the years a lot of kids come out of high school and then they go to college. And a lot of times I think coaches in high school tend to keep mileage fairly, fairly low, and then they go to a, a good college program and a lot of times mileage is doubling and you hear stress fractures. That's, and and a, a, col- a lot of times college coaches are trying to get that next college job. And how do you do that? People win. Yeah. And how do people win? You put a lot of miles on them. That's probably one concern I have is, is people getting, getting uh, maybe running too much yep. too soon yep. and burning out. Yep. I, I, I tend to take a slightly different approach to that, Good. which is um, – I found that the athletes who really tend to get fried early, it's not necessarily just the volume, but the intensity of the volume. Right. Um, that running a little more uh, in high school is okay if it's relatively controlled volume. It's usually the young kids, men and women, uh, who really, really tear apart the hard stuff uh, where it's lots of volume, but lots of it's hard that really struggle later. And if you take a look at the East Africans, one of their big strengths is strengths is they they are running a lot when they're younger, but it's very playful right. in nature. So by the time they're 20, they have thousands and thousands of miles on their legs that Western kids don't have. So um, I don't necessarily mind if a kid is coming out of high school or college having run a little bit more. It's more the intensity that I think breaks people down. I'm not sure what Greg thinks about that. Well, and I think one of the other challenges we have in our current system is, and you alluded to it earlier, a kid's really good in high school. They have a wonderful relationship with their coach, and they're in this training system that has worked for them for three or four years. Let's take them out of that. Uh, yeah, <laughs> Put them in right. a different program. Oh, yeah. Establish a relationship with a different coach, different teammates, maybe a slightly altered training setup, and let's do that for a few years. Oh, they excel there. Okay, now I'll get rid of them again and send them to another. So there's lots of these transitions. So I feel like hopefully – with our increased knowledge and awareness and communication, I feel like high school coaching is getting better. And as a result, the transitions are getting easier. So we don't have such harsh transitions when these really great athletes have to go from uh, one setup to another, which is a challenge anyway if you're going from high school to college. That's a lot of life life adjustments. So uh, that, I feel like, is also one of the big challenges for these really good runners having to do these switches at least multiple times over right. their careers. Guys, thank you so much for taking time. Always a pleasure to catch up. Pete, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Yeah. All right. Come visit us in North Carolina. Always. always a pleasure. Take care. Hey, everybody, again, Breakfast with Bob, Boston Marathon Edition. Hold on. We will be right back.